There's a lot of reasons why I'm really happy to be working with Greenish, but one of the main ones is their brand philosophy, which is also my personal philosophy, and that is embracing this passion for life. They develop products that help you live your life to the fullest in a wholesome and a healthy way. And Greenish products are really those that I trust, and I trust that you'll trust them as well, because it's all about living your life to the fullest. A good day to all of you and welcome to the show Living Multiculturalism with Mayank Bhatt. You are watching TAG TV. The program is brought to you by the Canadian Thinkers Forum. Friends, today we have with us Lisa D. Nicolitz and she will correct my pronunciation very soon. Uh, she is uh, a fantastic novelist. She has done uh, five novels so far in a career that spans uh, less than two decades. Uh, all of these books have been very well received. All of these books are as different from each other as chalk from cheese. Uh, it's her journey as a writer has been very inspiring uh, for people like me who are aspiring writers themselves. Uh, welcome me, uh, join me in welcoming her. Welcome to the show, Lisa. Thank you, Mayank. And, Thank you and very I much. will first invite you to correct my pronunciation about your last name. My, my last name is a very tricky one, and sometimes I think I should have changed it to a more simple name. It's De Nicolets. De Nicolets. Yes. Sorry about that. that don't worry. <laughs> so let's let's begin the conversation by a very simple and straightforward question. Why do you write? It's something I've always done. It's something that if I don't do, I'm deeply unhappy. I have to do it. And uh, your journey as a novelist uh, began uh, almost 16 years ago, or would that be right to say? Um, you'd be correct, except, well, in a sense, I was writing before that. I was writing in South Africa. I wrote long manuscripts, um, and I would post them off to people, but they were really very, uh, they were not learned. I studied English and philosophy, and I, n I had not learned the craft of writing a novel. But I'd always been told that I had a way with words and that I was a good writer. And so I took that to mean your books are good as they are. I didn't realize that they had to be written differently, they had to be improved, they had to be crafted, they had to be structured. So for many years I suffered in grave dismay and disappointment because I would send these very, very long novels off. I mean, they used to write sort of, you know, 160,000 word novels and print them out and go to the post office and send them all off and then, you know, re get these rejection letters. And that went on for many, many, many years to the point where I, I would never say I'd given up. I never gave up. But there was a point where when I left South Africa to go to Australia, um, I kind of thought to myself, well, that is behind me. My writing days are behind me. And it was only when I came to Canada and I realized the wealth of the writing world here that I had a small glimmer of hope. I thought maybe something might happen here. And that was one of the primary reasons that I stayed here in Canada. So, so from, from South Africa, you went to Australia. Yes. Uh, why did you leave South Africa? Um, I did not leave South Africa for any kind of noble and political reasons, I am ashamed to say. I went because I am my day job, I'm a magazine art director. And my sister had gone to Australia and she said to me, the magazines here are amazing. So I went over for some interviews and I was offered a job with Vogue Living. Um, and I mean, to work for Vogue is you know, a dream come true. Um, but it was, I did not enjoy living in Australia. And I think that's very pertinent to our discussion today because my experience in Australia um, and their non-multiculturalism was completely different to my experience here in Canada. Australia was not a welcoming country. And so after two years, I decided to leave there. I, so, if, if I were to understand you as a creative uh, person, then there will be elements of uh, South Africa, uh, there would be your Hungarian roots, there would be some element of Australia and a large part of Canada. Definitely. And so, how do each of these personalities kind of, you know, unite into one and uh, become the writer that you have become? I think South Africa brings my ideas of home and home country and happiness growing up under that sunshine in the sunshine sky and the smells of the dust and to me when I think of South Africa I think of happiness. When I think of Australia I think of pain 
and being ostracized. Um, but I am welcoming of that experience because that definitely made me a better writer. When I think of Canada, I think of being welcomed and of forging a new home and a new beginning. When I think of the Hungarian aspect, I think of my Najmama, my grandmother, who was perhaps one of the most supportive people of me my entire life. Uh, and I, I love her to pieces, and I still feel that she looks down on me from wherever she is, and I often chat to her. So um, she definitely, and she was also a great storyteller. I remember being a small child, and when she would babysit, she would tell me stories of Huvak Machi. The other thing that I have noticed is that all your novels have followed each other in a quick succession. Yes. Uh, it may to a traditional writer seem kind of uh, inexplicable uh, that how have you managed to be this prolific. But from what you tell me is that it could probably be because you had this humongous quantity of writing already under your belt, so to speak. But I want you to expand on that. I think you're quite right, Mike. And, and now I have a publisher who believes in my voice. And that is, I think if there is a great gift in my life that has been bestowed on me in Canada, it is, it is that. She has, so when I'm writing, it's no longer the worry of who is going to publish this because she really loves the work. So in fact, we have a book scheduled for, 2016 is a book called The Nearly Girl. 2017 is a book called No Fury Like That. And I recently sent her another manuscript called Rotten Peaches, which I'm hoping will be 2018. And then I do have an idea uh, for hopefully a 2019 book. So talk to, tell me about this publisher, who she is, and what um, is the publishing house does? Well, Inanna Publications, and actually how I came to them was an act of generosity by another publisher, because I had sent The Hungry Mirror to Second Story Press. and. You know how it goes, you send things out, you get the standard rejection, and it just seems like nothing, you're never going to get that break. And then Second Story sent me a, actually a really nice rejection letter, it was more personalized, and it was via email, and you know one never complains, you know that, you, oh yeah. you never email back and go, but I, I emailed back and I said, you know, thank you very much, and I have to admit I'm really disappointed, I was really hoping to work with you, and they said, why don't you try Inanna? And so they were the ones who put me onto Inanna, for which I'm really grateful because it was also a stroke of luck because that doesn't happen often. Usually you just get a this rejection letter and that's the end of it. But uh, they were very, very nice. And then I met up with Luciana, submitted The Hungry Mirror, and then we've been together since then. Who was Luciana? Oh, Luciana Ricciatelli. She is my editor-in-chief and publisher at Inanna Publications. And I also call her my guardian angel and all good things. She's, she's wonderful. She's absolutely wonderful. How, how has she influenced your writing, if at all? Oh, hugely, Mike. Because even with the first book that I sent her, my timeline was utterly confused. And she said to me, what, what day is this? What month is this? How long has this you know, so that was the first thing I, I really learned about timelines. So now, when I write a manuscript, the first thing I do is get a calendar and I keep track of the timeline within the manuscript. I am very, very vigilant about that. Um, and she's very meticulous about details. So as I'm writing, I hear her voice in my head. Because um, sometimes she'll send me back manuscripts and they'll say, please clarify. So when I get to a point that I've written, I can almost hear her saying, please clarify. And then I'll think to myself, do I need to clarify in backstory so that I can explain to her what it is? Or do I need to explain to the reader? So the please clarify is a big thing that is in my head the whole time when I'm writing. And definitely the timelines. Um, you know, to keep track of that, how long something took, um, what the season was at that time, what was happening in the world at that time. So she, she's really taught me to, to pay very careful attention to those kinds of details and also to the structure of the writing and how much you need to um, divulge to a reader in terms of backstory and things like that. So yeah, she's, she has been amazing, an amazing gift. One, one of the questions that I normally ask all the authors who've come to my program, my show, is, is we live in a multicultural society. Yes. We are either, at least most of the people who come on the show have been people who decided to make Canada their home. 
Uh, it's a very different kind of experience for people who are born and raised in Canada and become writers and for those who are not born and raised here but have adopted Canada as their home and have chosen to become writers. Uh, what, is, what has been your experience in, as a creative person, not as an individual, not as a citizen, but as a creative person uh, living in Canada, working in Canada, creating in Canada? As a multicultural person, you mean? As no, a as, as a person who is not born and raised here, but from a different culture, and then you come here and then you kind of, you know, adopt this as your place and home. It's been fantastic, Mike. I mean, the writing community in it, as one aspect of it has been, and, and as I said, that was one of the main reasons I decided to stay in, in Canada because I was, my heart was set on getting a job in New York. I wanted, you know, art direction job in New York and that was, that was my focus. And then when I realized the, the wealth of writing, because I even realized that uh, many of the writers that I had loved um, were, were Canadian. You know, when you go somewhere and you're like, right, that person is Canadian, but you don't really make the connection until you're there. And so that's, that was very much played into a part of, of why I stayed. Yes, I was very, very focused on this high-flying career in New York. And then I asked myself the question, do you really want to stay in Canada? You know, the weather's, it's, it's kind of tough. Uh, not so much the winters, I love the winters, but the long periods of brown in between, I, I find them very like, tough to deal with. Um, but uh, then, you know, the New York thing, it, it was kind of like the big shining light. Oh, sorry, I must put my hands. And, um, and it was beckoning. And I also had this perception of Toronto that um, I hope won't sound negative, that it was the biggest small town in the whole world and that it was endlessly gray and endlessly flat. And, and, and I didn't fall in love with it at all. So I thought, why, why do you really want to stay? And it comes down to the culture and the people. And regardless of the big bright lights in New York and regardless of the weather, which can be quite trying, and regardless of the fact that I don't consider Toronto to be one of the architecturally most beautiful cities in the world, the people and the culture are what make it a fantastic place to live as a creative person. And, and I, I like the description, the biggest the small. biggest small town in the world. In the world, yes. And, and it, it is a place that nurtures you as a creative person. Now, if, w if I were to break down your experiences I as an individual, then clearly one aspect of your life would also uh, relate in some ways to the whole experience of apartheid in uh, South Africa. And you were born and raised during that period. Yes. Uh, it is beautifully brought out in one of your books. You, you know, you don't directly deal with it, but indirectly in so many different ways you convey the utter desperation that comes out of that experience. Thank you, Mike. That was very much my intention with that book. Yeah. So I wanted to describe that in, in more details. It was a very, very, very bizarre place to live in because um, you're in a situation where you are powerless to change something and it is everywhere you turn the injustice is there and in a sense there, there isn't anything you can do on a big scale you try to do what you can on a small scale and then when you can then translate that into a creative work that makes a statement that is then you feel like well I tried to do something I, I tried to say something but you know we we lived a, a very unconventional life in a sense my family and I um, we my, my parents at one point decided we needed to get back to the land they said so they moved us on to um, seven acres in, in the middle of the wilderness and you know we lived in two rooms without electricity and without running water and things like this yes so I I was blessed in that I had really very very unconventional parents and you know then we we started building what was in this the stables which had um, what was in, in South Africa known as the servants' quarters, and they were actually a lot, a lot more luxurious than the two rooms that we were living in. So I was really, really fortunate in that I had 
these parents who who were very different in the way that they thought and and that was that was a blessing as well but but even you know to refer to something as servants quarters it uh, it sounds like something terrible out of you know the, the the slave days back in the united states and and yet you know that's that's what they were called and things like that just re really completely wrong um, and and that was the given it was the given norm and not only the given norm and you know it was obviously the the law at that time you know it it's completely utterly depressing to have gone through that experience yes uh, do I don't you, think you do uh, sorry, uh, sorry Mike don't no. mean to interrupt I don't think you ever get over the guilt of that you know I don't think even you when you're not directly responsible for anything definitely definitely why is that because somehow you think how could I you know I went to a privileged school and people were dying in these prisons and you know protest writers were you know writing poems and oh you know he 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 slipped on the soap and he f he fell out the window and all these terrible things were happening and you know these people were being tortured and you would walk past these places in your you know cuz also went to good school your you know your private convent school girl uniform and you had all these all this privilege and then there were all these people and they had nothing and how how do you get over that i don't think you ever really can you know i mean yeah, it's uh, i'm not saying they were at that point what take your uniform off and you know burn that that wouldn't have been a solution but but I don't think you get over being part of that injustice would, would you in any way relate to uh, in, in a very different context racism in North America would that be comparable to apartheid in South Africa yes and I find it very distressing I mean the, the thing is it, obviously it's not legalized here but you know how the Aboriginal Jesus, it's terrible, Mike, and it's 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 extremely racist, and somehow it is you know politely just not addressed, and yet you know it it's horrendous and deeply upsetting. We, when we talk of multiculturalism, and I have noticed this in Canada over the past few years, because you know it's, it's difficult to understand the concept to begin with when you're new here. Yes. And I've been here only eight years, but there is a very conscious, uh, unconscious attempt to not include the aboriginals when we talk of multiculturalism and i wonder what is the reason for that i don't know but i think that is something that we should all work at changing because it is very it is it is so wrong okay let's let's move to something that is uh, also an aspect of your creativity which is the fact that you are an art director yes uh, which basically means visualization and it's it's a way intricate and involved kind of vocation yes uh, I wanted to firstly explain what you do and then the question that follows from that is how does that impact your writing I feel that um, I'm a Gemini and I feel that in the sense that there are sort of two aspects to the Gemini personality there are the two aspects to me the one is the designers so what I do is I put magazine pages together and there are different levels of it for, for example if there's a visual either I will commission a shoot for that visual and then choose the models who are in that shoot choose the photographer choose the hair and makeup choose the location if it is a stock shot then I will look through the various stock agencies and find something that fits that page and then I will place that visual on the page then I'll decide what typography is going to go with that and then I'll decide what the grid is going to be and uh, I, I really really learnt my craft very very well so I'm meticulous in terms of you know uh, consistency um, and 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 type I love typography um, the kerning which is the space between letters are uh, endlessly fascinates me and different type different typography different fonts so I'll bring all those aspects together to create a page and then I will do that for every page in the magazine and then the front cover is of course your cherry on the top and that is the thing and so when I'm when I'm doing this it is fully fully engaging however it's not the same um, bone marrow extraction pain that is writing it is 
um, it is a very pleasurable experience. So writing, as I'm right, when I'm writing, it's not pleasurable, it's very painful. But when I'm art directing and designing, I'm having fun. It's great fun. And that was why when I first discovered the job, I was like, my heavens, they pay you to do this. It's such fun. And so I have a lot of fun when I work. And I need that fun because the writing is so incredibly exhausting. And when I am art directing, um, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking about my characters and what they might be doing. Not at a conscious level, but I'm wondering, what are they doing? And you know, I'll make little notes and things like this, because the art direction is, is definitely more of a playground than the writing. The other aspect that I have always wanted to understand of, of people who come here, you, you came here, you started your life, you then set up a family, right? How has that experience shaped you as a writer? Well, I'm very blessed in that my husband is a fellow creative person. He's a photographer. And he is probably as different to me in the creative process as anyone could be. He is extremely patient. I am not a patient person. And he puts immense hours into research. He's, he, he's doing this thing called gum printing, which he's tried to explain to me. And honestly, I don't understand, except that there's a lot of um, sort of things in the basement with different chemicals and stuff in them. And it sounds like a nightmare what he's trying to achieve. He has to put exposed paper and do all these different things. So that is a, a really good example of how he will spend hours on doing something that may or may not end up being a, a, a work of art. And when he does something, I'll say to him, and uh, when he does something and he shows me, it's always beautiful. I'll say to him, wow, you should submit that to you know, a gallery or a, 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 or, or, or a book or contest or something. But he is not about that. He is about the art and the process. I am about getting the stories into the published work so that then I can move on to the next thing. Because until they're published, they roam around in my head and drive me nuts. So his focus in the artistic process is very different to mine. His truly is about the art. Um, and so he, he will spend longer on a project. He also is incredibly helpful in that he reads my manuscripts. And he's a great reader. And he will tell me, this is not holding my attention, or this is inconsistent, or this reminds me of a book. Or, and he has thousands of books. And he'll say to me, here, read this book. I think maybe you're trying to do something along these lines. And I'll read the book, and then I'll go back and revisit what I'm doing. So on many levels, he's, he's very supportive and in a creative way, very inspiring. We, we were talking about uh, the process of creativity earlier, and, and you said that you know it's important to be in Toronto because the writing community is nurturing all yes. the time. You know, they, they give you ideas, they support you, they lead you in the right direction. Yes. Uh, you were also talking about how uh, your experiences have been with some book clubs. Uh, you know, give me examples of how your friends who are writers have influenced you. Well, it's just wonderful, Mike. For example, I mean, you know, as a writer, you'll do something. And, and I mean, they're highs and lows. They're terrible highs and lows. And when you're in the lows, to be able to email a friend and say, you know, feel like nothing's happening. And then you, you immediately receive the, 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 you know, support. Or if you write a short story and you want to submit it, and then I'll, I'll email it to a friend and say, do you think this is any good? And immediately she will read it and I, I'm the same if someone says if sends me something and they're like I don't know about this immediately I'm there and, and if I can't write, read it exactly then I'll let them know exactly like, when my time frame is and then I'll I will make sure that I work that in so we and then I'll say oh, you know what I think that this might be a good publisher for you or why don't you try these people so and and the response is instantaneous when when you are in that little slump or when you want to share good news everyone rallies around and then celebrate you know, they rally around in, in darker moments and they, then they celebrate with you and so it's a it's a, it's a wonderful experience I, I want to recall and recollect one incident that uh, we shared you know I, I we had been introduced probably the second time we met and and we were discussing how important it is to change manuscripts and I said I have to I've been told that I need to get rid of one third of my manuscript and you gave you, you had not read my manuscript, but you gave me an advice that stays with me even today, which is you have to kill what you have to kill. Have you had to kind of go through that experience? Yes, a lot. And I remember our conversation very clearly because I understood 
at that point because when I realized that as well um, and it was primarily with West of Wawa that I, I pretty much had to rewrite I think I mentioned to you the um, initially the first draft was based the character was based on me and she had been called banal and she showed no character development in the book and that was somewhat crushing and you think to yourself but I don't I don't want you this is this is my voice and you think at that point you know when you're starting out no, um, my integrity is retaining my words. But then you realize, well, I realize as well, no, I'll just go and write something different then. And so, yes, y you then realize, okay, so that has to be killed. And I definitely had that experience. Um, with The Witch Doctor's Bones, I had to do a lot of rewrites. That was one, in actual fact, it was too long. Um, the certain characters didn't resonate with my publisher, so I had to I had to kill them. Off they went. Um, certain books have definitely needed more rewriting than others. The funny thing is, The Witch Doctor's Bones I think needed more rewriting because it was too close to my heart. So I put too much in. I, I haven't actually read everything that you've yeah. written, but I think I think The Witch Doctor's Bones uh, is a far better work compared to West of Wawa. If I can be permitted to make that uh, judgment. It would be welcomed, Mayank, thank you, because I, of all the books, um, in a sense, you know, The Witch Doctor's Bones probably, I would say, did not receive what I had hoped um, it would. So, and I agree with you, I think it is a better book, but you know, West of Wawa, and maybe this is an interesting um, segue for our discussion, West of Wawa um, is a very Canadian story, but The Witch Doctor's Bones is a very African story. And so one cannot help but wonder, like, is the Canadian book more well received because it's about Canada? I, I'm, I'm just throwing that question out there. Um, as I mentioned to you, I you got um, b back sort of a, a list of who's reading what in the library, which is fantastic. The fact that people are reading books in, my, in the library, my books in the library is amazing. But th the Witch Doctor's Bones was, was lagging behind. And, you know, my husband laughed at me. He said to me, why aren't you being happy about all the ones that they are reading? Why are you just sad about the fact that the Witch Doctor's Bones is the one that's last on the list? And it's because I agree with you. I, I think it's a good book. E I've had this discussion with another writer who was uh, who I'd spoken to about a few weeks back. Uh, how much of you know when when you come from a different context, a different culture, how much of what you create is nostalgia, and how much of what you create should be contemporary Canada? Is mm -hmm. is a question that is it, it? I'm obsessed with it because you know a lot of people, to them, creativity is not about Canada. It is about what they were, and to me, it it kind of seems very hollow. What what do you think? I think that with the witch doctor's bones, um, I was there was definitely when it came to describing the scenery and the descriptions, that was nostalgia, and the again the dust, the felt, the skies, the smells, the Africa. I I miss how it smells. It's such a rich and vibrant country from that point of view. You know, sometimes in the peak of summer, if you're walking along in Canada, you can, you can smell certain flowers and certain, you know, the grass has been cut, but, but it's not as vivid as Africa. Africa is such a powerfully nasal country. You can just close your eyes and breathe it in. It's fantastic. And so in, from a nostalgia point of view, I really wanted to bring that into the book. In terms of the other writing, I would say there's probably very little of me and my personal experiences and nostalgia that, that find their way into the book. And as you said, you know, Chalk and Cheese, they're all very different books. Oh, yes, they yes, are. Yes, yes. Undoubtedly. Exactly. No, my, my question had to do more with, uh, as, as a creative process, it's easier always to deal with nostalgia because you right. know that better than what you know the present. Right. And that, that is the challenge for a writer in a multicultural society is to create Canada that is his or her own. Right. Not the South Africa that was yours or India that right. was mine. Right. Exactly. I mean, and the challenge as a writer to me is to create my Canada. Yes. I think well, West of Wawa was probably the only book in which I really dealt with Canada. Um, a Glittering Chaos was set in Las, Las Vegas and Germany. 
Um, the, the Nearly Girl, which is coming out in fall, that is set in Canada. It's set in um, Scarborough and Toronto, although they somewhat remain nameless. And actually, between the cracks she fell, that is set in Toronto. And I sort of merged the beaches um, with Bowmanville. And in terms of the culture, the Canadian culture, that is very... Um, current Canadian culture that um, that uh, that I, I, I drew in, but then I also drew in the the immigrant experience that was also important to me with this book of people who are feel that they are not a part of Canada, and I think that's the piece that I'm going to read to you um, at the end of our chat is the bit where actually she is saying how she she has no home and she feels so alone. So within the context of current Canada. Are people? Um, there's Imran, who is a, an Islamic student, and you know he feels very isolated and alienated within current Canada. Um, Jocelyn, the protagonist, she's from Britain, and she feels very isolated within the current Canada. Um, so I'm not sure. Does that maybe answer more? It does. In in in, in many different ways, it does. Certainly does. Uh, what I'm going to now do is to invite you to read uh, a passage from your latest novel. So you know. Let's let's have something from. Okay. And uh, all my chapters are named, and this one is called "Those That Run." I returned to the swimming pool early the next day, leaving only to buy a slice of pizza and then finally to make my way home before dark. It was supposed to rain, but it didn't. It was 36 degrees in the shade under my oak tree in the late evening, and the birds were singing wild songs, chirping, tweeting, even yapping. The cool breeze helped briefly, like the brush of a blue satin sheet, but it only teased and had vanished too soon. I hadn't seen Lenny in ages, and I'd nearly forgotten about him when I went back to the swimming pool the next day and bumped into him, literally. Whoa, he said, putting his hand on my chest. If it isn't Alleluia Ice Queen Cone, Kitty Cat laughed. Good one, Ice Cream Cone. Lenny ignored her, and I felt hurt by his taunts. It wasn't me who left that night, and I knew that none of it should have happened, but I wasn't the one to blame, and why did he hate me now? I looked at him, thinking, so what if he saw that I was upset? But then I changed my mind, and I leaned down, exaggerating the motion to show my height over his. And I smelled that hash and Irish spring mixed, and I whispered in his ear, you're just sore because you can't have me, Lenny. And I let my breath tickle his ear. And you, neither devil nor angel, will lose everything. You'll see. He pulled back in anger. That's what you think, he said, furious. I never lose. I always get what I want. You'll be the one who sees. I looked at him again as he leaned in close, and I felt that weird arousal. I form the light and create the darkness. I make peace and create evil, he quoted. And I stayed where I was, close to him, seemingly unable to pull away. Lenny, my obnoxious magnet. You're a legend in your own lunchbox, I whispered. Have a nice day. And I forced myself to leave him, and I walked away. And I was determined not to show my fear by scurrying but I could hardly breathe, and my breakfast rose in my throat night to swallow it down. I'd been stupid to antagonize him, but it seemed like we were destined to collide, what, regardless of what we did. And I couldn't enjoy the swimming pool in the same way as before, even although I tried. And the words of my book swam before my eyes. Falling like that, out of the sky? Did they imagine there would be no side effects? I don't know what I had imagined would happen, but seeing Lenny again had shattered the peace I'd felt. And once again, I was alone and vulnerable and lost. And I decided out of the blue to pray. Hey God, if you're there at all, how about sending me a friend? I'm tired of only having my book for company and the jottings of some kid. How about it? Are you even there? Consider this a test and maybe we aren't supposed to test you, but never mind. I'm testing you and I need a friend right about now. Nothing happened, not that I thought it would. When I left the swimming pool, I walked past the blonde girl with the big dog, and she stopped as I went by, as if she would be open to conversation, but I, for once, wanted no part of it. And besides, this time, I was the one who was crying. And I walked, still crying, through the hot haze that hung low, like a gauzy, unwashed curtain in a sad sack dollar store, and I cried about Shane. 
and I cried because I felt I'd been unfair and cruel to Mr. Allwright, who really had tried to be my dad. And I cried because I missed my house. And I cried because no one in the world knew where I was. So. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you. Uh, friends, so we were talking with Lisa. I will not make the mistake of mispronouncing her last name again. Uh, but uh, as usual, it was uh, an experience that I hope will help us understand the whole process of writing and the process of writing in Canada better. Thank you once again for being with us. Thank you very much, Mayank. Thank you very much. Friends, you are watching Living Multiculturalism with Mayank Bhatt on TAG TV. The show is brought to you by the Canadian Thinkers Forum. I always end the program with a request. Write to us. I want to hear from you. We want to invite writers that you want to see, you want to interact with. Send us your suggestions and keep watching. Thank you very much. Number one multicultural channel. This is Tag TV.